Our second reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Listen carefully for God's word. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the mid-90s, there was a movie that came out. You may have seen it. It was directed by Christopher Guest and Eugene Levy. It might be a stretch to call this a real movie. It's more in the style of what is called a mockumentary. The movie is called Waiting for Guffman. Residents of the fictional town of Blaine, Missouri, plan to put on a community play to celebrate the 150th birthday of Blaine. The play, they titled it Red, White, and Blaine. The director of the play, Corky St. Clair, casts the play and uses a past connection from off, 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 off Broadway to invite a Broadway producer, Mort Guffman, to come and see their play. The cast, they hear about Guffman that is coming and his impending attendance and anxiety and stress, they begin to rise. They want to make sure the play is perfect. And who knows, with more Guffman in the audience, maybe the play will get put on off, 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 off Broadway. All sorts of things go wrong as they prepare for their performance on this shoestring budget. And it largely goes wrong because they are so nervous then Mort Guffman will be in attendance. On the night of the play, they wait in anticipation for Guffman to arrive and take his seat. And though, although a man does sit in his seat, the cast thinking it is Mort Guffman, it turns out to not be him. In fact, Guffman's plane was delayed and he would never, ever arrive. The waiting and anticipation for Guffman's arrival was so stressful that it caused all sorts of problems. And in the end, none of it would matter because Guffman would never actually arrive. Waiting, it's hard. It's hard because it keeps the desired emotions and outcomes of whatever assumed expectations we have, and it keeps them at a distance. It keeps us in this weird liminal space where we are unsure of what will become, of what will happen. It's the literal opposite of immediacy in a world where immediacy is king. We can't wait for information, the news, the score of the game, decisions to be made, either good or bad. We can't even wait to be entertained. We've become so entrenched and conditioned by an accessible world that we don't simply consume goods and products anymore. We consume immediacy. It's a marketer's dream. Amazon Prime is no longer a sales tactic. It's a way of life. We hate waiting so much that Halloween decorations come out in September. Thanksgiving begins in October and Christmas starts before we have even had Thanksgiving. We really don't like to wait. 
Waiting is hard on so many levels. I don't even like waiting 40 seconds to get a response to my text message while the Israelites waited 40 years in the desert to simply come to the promised land. The old phrase, time is money, may be true, but what is even more true is that time is time, and we don't like to wait for time to go by. We want what we want, and we want it now. We want it at our very own fingertips. This Matthew text that we read is often used to simply talk about faith, faith to get out of the boat. As in, Peter had enough faith to step out of the boat, but not enough faith to believe that Jesus would save him if he fell into the water. But there's no expectation or indication in the text there was anything wrong with Peter walking on the water. The water was choppy, but Peter seemed to be doing just fine. What we miss in this text isn't about faith. It's about the relationship between faith and waiting. It's not that Peter didn't have faith. I mean, he got out of the boat in the first place. It's that Peter wasn't willing to wait in order to see his faith in Jesus' ability to walk on water and to save him if he fell. He did not wait for Jesus to act. Peter's faith and our own don't like to wait for God to act. For Peter to walk to Jesus, he would have to take all of the steps and wait the time that it took to do so. But those steps on the water seemed like they were taking far, far too long. Far too long for Peter to wait and to see what might happen. He obviously knew Jesus would save him if he fell. I mean, this is exactly why he called out to him in fear. I wonder what he would have thought if he just kept walking and took another step to meet Jesus. The text indicates he wasn't even far from Jesus at all. After all, Jesus was close enough to reach out his hand to grab him and to save him. He had the faith to step out of the boat but not to wait and to keep walking. And Peter isn't much different from us 2,000 years later. We don't want to see, wait to see what Jesus is going to do, how he might lead us, what, might, what he might have to say. And this is why prayer is so hard for us, especially in our 20, 21st century world, because prayer requires waiting for God to speak back to us or at least quieting the noise of a busy world to simply listen. We want faith and what comes from it to be immediate, but that wouldn't be faith. That's what we would call certainty. And faith isn't faith without waiting for the one in whom we have our faith and our very being in. We live in this time that, Hart, that sociologist Hartmut Rosa calls and describes as an accelerated world where all things are considered to be accessible, available, and attainable. In other words, our world has sped up and so have we. Everything is accessible immediately. Everything we are told is attainable if we simply work hard enough and all of the resources that we need to get there are available. The more the world accelerates, the more we accelerate our desires for immediacy. And faith in Christ is not immune from this desire. The theologian Andy Root, in his book, Churches in the Crisis of Decline, a hopeful ecclesiology for a secular age, makes a distinction between what he calls waiting toward having and waiting toward being. When we wait to have, we wait anxiously for what we think is already ours. When we wait, we do so with a frustration that we do not already have what we desire right away or what we deem to be already ours. It's the waiting for Guffman of the real world. 
When we wait toward having, we wait for things. We wait for things to fill the void of our desires. And when those things fall short, we wait again. And as we wait, we become impatient, wanting more things to fill the void of our heart's desires. And we want them faster and faster and faster, having faith in these things that they will satisfy us. But they never, ever do. When we wait toward being, we are able to embody a life that is not about having something that is ours, having something that we own. Rather, waiting for being seems faith as a pure gift. It's a waiting that is grounded in the anticipation that God will speak to us, that we can walk on water, and that if we fall, God will act to save us. When we wait toward being, we become the beings that we were created to be, beings in unity with Christ, rather than some amalgamation of unsatisfactory and unmet desires. There's not much waiting that goes on in our world. The church is guilty of this too. We all are. But there are a few places and things in this world that still require waiting, the DMV being one of them. Another is bird watching. Now I know all of the Trinity bird watchers finally feel seen. The other week I was reading this book by theologian Rowan Williams and he enjoys bird watching. And in an analogy, he said, when you're bird watching, you are always waiting in anticipation for the bird that you expect to see and the bird that you do not expect to see. When you bird watch, you exist with a constant sense of curiosity for what you might encounter. And when you encounter something spectacular, you are in awe. And when you don't, you wait and you wait and you wait again with the hope that you may encounter what you expect. But nevertheless, you wait with anticipation. Part of faith is the act of waiting. Waiting is actually baked into the concept of faith for humans. Our faith is in a God in whom we utterly rely on, yet our very own humanness keeps us from utter reliance because utter reliance on someone or something else removes our ability to control when we receive what we believe we are in need of or what we desire. Faith begins with waiting for God to speak waiting for a true encounter with the living Christ. And faithful waiting is the act of not letting our past or our present desires for immediacy and quick fixes to limit what God might be saying to us or to put God entirely on mute. In a world filled with injustices and brokenness of all stripes, it is so easy for us to say that we must act right now and sometimes acting right now is indeed the result of listening and faithful waiting over time. But it is all too often an attempt to satisfy our desire for virtue rather than an act of true liberation. And if we are always waiting faithfully with anticipation and expectation, that God will actually speak to us, that God is still speaking to us this day, that God will and does act in our world, then when we are met with the moments in which we must act and act quickly for the sake of our neighbors and ourselves, we will be more than prepared because through our waiting, God has been preparing us all the while long. Faithful waiting, it's not an attempt at the can down the road of delaying uncomfortability, although some may use it as such. Faithful waiting is the act of waiting for God to speak so that we might know what it is that God is asking us to do. What is it that God is asking us to do? It's the question that we all want to ask. It's the question that gives us the courage and faith to step out of the boat in the very first place. 
but it is the waiting and listening that gives us our answers. The problem lies when we do wait and we do listen, and then we realize that we do not like the answer. The answer that we receive from God will likely require sacrifice, the giving up of something for the sake of God or for others. The answer might make you uncomfortable. The answer might make you change. The answer might challenge your faith in the one whom you are supposed to utterly rely upon. Before Peter hopped out of the boat, Jesus said something that was very profound to him. And if you were to read the text like a simple story, you would think it would quell any and all of Peter's fears. Jesus simply said, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. But it doesn't quell Peter's fears. Jesus' proclamation, do not be afraid, gets him as far as out of the boat, but not all the way to Jesus. And this is the same thing that Jesus says to us today and has been saying to us all along. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. When we recognize not only that God is with us and that we should not fear, we come to the realization that even in our waiting and in our impatience, even as we squirm or suffer in our waiting, that God is actually waiting with us. There is never a moment, as Psalm 121 tells us, where God is slumbering. God is always the shade at our right hand. God is always on the journey with us. Take heart when you feel as though the world is crumbling. Take heart when you feel as though you must do something and act. Take heart and wait. Do not wait out of apathy, but wait because waiting is a verb. It's the act of fidelity to the God who is always acting and always speaking. So we, we must wait with hope and anticipation for the moment in which our waiting comes into union with God speaking. And the question of what am I to do is answered. And the answer will always begin with take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Waiting for God to speak to us is both the act of rejecting the speed of an accelerated world of immediacy and mindedness, and at the same time, a rejection of a world that enjoys apathy towards injustices and oppression, because the faithful act of waiting anticipates that God will act, and that God will help us to act in a way that truly blots out injustices, that truly helps us to love our neighbor better, that truly allows us to feel love and forgiveness, that truly helps us to see others and ourselves through the eyes of Christ. It is a waiting that will amount to the embodiment, the reality of lived faith, hope, and love rather than awaiting that perpetuates immediacy on the one hand and apathy on the other. If Peter had waited and taken just a few more steps, he would have met Jesus. And I hope that we will wait to meet Jesus. But it is good news that even when we fail to wait, and fail to wait we will, Jesus will meet us, will catch us when we fall, because Jesus himself is faithfully waiting for each and every one of us to step out of the boat in the very first place so that we might meet Jesus, that we might be transformed, and that we might act on account of the fact that God is always acting and speaking in our worlds. Let us not wait towards apathy. Let us not wait towards having, but wait toward being, that we might become the beings in this world that God has intended each and every one of us to be. To God be the glory. Amen.